So welcome to this afternoon's Reform Scotland event. I'm Alison Payne, I'm the Research Director at Reform Scotland, and sadly not Chris Deeran, who can't make it this afternoon due to a rather bad dose of COVID. But thankfully, you won't need to listen to me too much because we've got an excellent panel and what should be a fascinating discussion about what's going wrong in Scottish education, but more importantly, how we can put things right. Last week's PISA results highlighted how uh, Scotland is continuing to decline in um, key areas of math, science and reading, a decline that long predates uh, the pandemic. And this week we saw the publication of the achievement of curriculum for excellence levels data, which is suggesting that one in four primary pupils are not achieving the expected literacy levels and one in five are not achieving the expected um, levels in maths. So an education system that was once regarded one of the best in the world can no longer claim to be so. Why have politicians been able, unable to fix it? And how can we improve things? How can we get Scotland's education system back on the right track? Each of our speakers will be giving a short opening statement. And um, we're going to begin with Lindsay Patterson, who is going to explain last week's PISA details. We'll then hear from former head teacher Carol Ford about the situation in our classrooms. Then our Commission on School Reform Chair, Keir Bloomer, will explain the principles behind Curriculum for Excellence and why a curriculum which had broad support, indeed broad cross-party support, has gone so badly wrong with its implementation. Finally, Bruce Robertson, the rector of Berwickshire High School, will outline where we can go from here. We'll then have a short discussion amongst the panellists, and then, most important part, we'll throw open to questions from the audience, and we are really keen to hear from you. So if you do have any questions, please use the chat function and send me any questions you have. But for now, I'll pass you over to Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, the headlines from last week are well known. Uh, I will summarise them very briefly. I'm going to concentrate on attainment because attainment, without attainment, schooling doesn't achieve anything at all. Of course, there are other aspects of the PISA data that we might get into later on to do with, for example, students' well-being, the level of violence in schools. Some of that has already been exposed in the press, and we can come back to that perhaps in the discussion. I'm going to be mainly in this summary of a very complex data set. Compare 2022, which is the most recent data reported last week, with 2012, the full decade. And I'm going to draw some comparisons with England, not for reasons of parochialism or anything like that, but for two reasons. One is that comparing with England has kind of validity in assessing the effects of education systems because so much else is in common between the societies of Scotland and the society of England. For example, the labour market's very, very similar. The experience of COVID was similar and so on. So any differences between Scotland and England could reasonably, at least as a first hypothesis, be attributed to the education system. And of course, the other major reason to compare with England is that we in Scotland might actually learn something from England because England did rather better this time round in PISA and seemed to have less of a decline associated with COVID. OK. Three major things I'm going to see. First of all, the mean change, the average change. Now, rather than give the score values in the PISA test, I'm going to do what the OECD, who runs PISA, recommends, which is to say that a 20-point difference in the scores and the test results roughly corresponds to a year's worth of schooling at the age that the PISA students are at. In other words, about the middle of secondary school. That's an approximation, but the OECD has done some really good research on this. In fact, as it happened, Scotland was one of the data sets in that research from 2015 and 2018, which led to that broad conclusion. So first of all, on mathematics, um, compared with 2012, the decade from 2012 to 2022, Scottish students, 15 year olds, fell by the equivalent of 16 months of schooling. In contrast, English students over that same decade in mathematics fell by only two months. So a 16 months fall in Scotland, a two months fall in England. In science, it was an 18 month fall in Scotland and an eight month fall in England. And in reading, an eight month fall in Scotland compared with two months in England. So in each respect, the fall over the decade has been enormously greater in Scotland. 16 months, eight months, and 18 months compared to in England, two months, two months, and eight months. So that's the average, that's the headline figure. The two other things I'm going to look at. One is different points of the distribution attainment, very high attaining students and fairly low attaining students. After that, I'll go on to look at socially, socially, uh, socioeconomic inequality. So first of all, on the, the top and bottom of the attainment distribution. Now, first of all, looking at low attaining students, uh, which the OECD defines as people in the lowest 10% of attainment in, in the mathematics or science or, or reading. And the headline here for Scotland is that for the weakest students, the deterioration since 2012 is much worse than in England. 
So for the lowest attaining 10% in mathematics, these children deteriorated over the decade by the equivalent of 22 months of schooling. Whereas in England, that same group deteriorated by only two months of schooling. In other words, there was 10 times as great deterioration for the weaker students in Scotland as there was in England. For reading, it's a comparison of 20 months deterioration for the weaker students in Scotland, but seven months in England. For science, it is 28 months of deterioration for the academically weaker students in Scotland, but just 11 months deterioration in England. So in other words, in fact, if we focus on that last point there, for the weakest 10%, the slowest learners, the people who are requiring schools to the greatest extent, they have actually fallen back in the decade by somewhere in the region of two and a half years of schooling. What's more, if we then move to the other end of the distribution of attainment, which is the highest achieving 10%, Scotland is more behind England for the most able students than for the weakest students for the 10% that I've just been talking about. For example, in mathematics, Scotland is now eight months behind England for the lowest attaining, but 13 months behind for the highest attaining. In reading, there's no difference between the two countries uh, for the lowest attaining, but Scotland's three months behind England for the highest attaining. And in science, Scotland is seven months behind England for the lowest attaining, but 13 months behind England for the highest attaining. In other words, compared to England, a reasonable yardstick because it's a similar country, etc. as I said, on that basis, Scotland is not serving its most able students particularly well. And the third and the last thing that I'm going to be talking about is socioeconomic inequality. There's, there's a measure of this in the PISA data sets, which is a kind of scale that not just records same the, 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 the socioeconomic uh, occupations of the students' parents, but also, for example, like the number of books in the home, the number of other cultural resources, the kinds of educationally relevant activities that parents take the, the, the young people on. And we can divide the scale into four quarters in the OECD way. I'm going to compare the lowest quarter, the lowest status quarter, with the highest status quarter. Um, the headline here is that there have been large falls in the lowest status group. Whereas in England, that's in Scotland, there have been large falls in the lowest status group. Whereas in England, there have actually over this decade been gains in that group in mathematics and reading and barely any reduction in science. So the, here's the numbers. For the lowest status group in Scotland, over that period, that decade, there was a 22 month fall in the attainment of the lowest socioeconomic group. But in England, that same group actually increased its average score by three months. In reading, the Scottish fall for that lowest social status group was 12 months. In England, that group actually added five months in over the decade. In science, the fall for Scotland for the lowest status group was 23 months. In England, there was a fall of only one month. And as a consequence of that, in other words, as a consequence of the fact that England is doing better for the lowest socially, socioeconomic status students, the, the, those living in poverty, those at the bottom of the social hierarchy, England is doing better than Scotland from that. As a consequence of that, inequality in relation to socioeconomic circumstances has got larger in Scotland, but it has got slightly slower in England. And so the last point to say about this is that Scottish inequality in education is now greater than England in mathematics and similar in reading. That's me finished. A pass over now to Carol Ford. Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Lindsay has outlined, the decline in Scotland's standards in education has been continuing for a number of years, um, but with an acceleration since the advent of Curriculum for Excellence. What I want to describe this afternoon is the current position in Scottish classrooms and the issues we need to consider. I will mention Curriculum for Excellence only briefly because it is without doubt a key factor, but Keir will talk about that in more detail shortly. I want to look at this issue from the viewpoint of the classroom teacher. Make no mistake, it is what happens in classrooms which makes the difference to educational outcomes. That is why the recently abolished RICS regional improvement collaboratives had no impact. What difference does the existence of a RIC make to how a teacher or a classroom functions? In recent years and since 2000, Scotland's education system has experienced a number of significant changes, almost none of which appear to have borne fruit, but how would we know? They have never been properly evaluated. The lack of reliable data in the Scottish system is a feature in evaluating pupil progress, 
but it's also a feature in innovation and change. We seem to rely on inadequate piloting, usually in conditions which are not replicable across all schools. And I would mention the introduction of the teaching of foreign languages in primary schools in this regard. And we evaluate by means of positive comments from individual head teachers and political rhetoric, no data whatsoever. In the classroom, teachers have been subjected to a number of initiatives which have caused them to change their teaching styles. I can list a whole series of initiatives which have been implemented in our schools, all of which were expensive to implement, time consuming for teachers, and have led to an undermining of school and teacher autonomy since implementation was obligatory. In no particular order, to quote a well-known phrase, we have programmed learning, which reduced the role of the teacher to a purely administrative one. We had brain gym, with pupils performing a series of physical jerks throughout the day. We've had assessment is for learning, and we have had the now totally debunked learning styles. We have the almost ubiquitous starters, learning outcomes and plenary sessions, which take a lot of time in classrooms, with still no evidence that they are useful. In short, classroom teachers have been subjected to a range of diktats about how to teach, none of which have been evaluated or, so it now appears from PISA, successful. While standards have declined, so too has discipline. We have the recent surveys by the government and the EIS, which show an increase in violence and disruption. But from personal observation and talking to teachers, there is now in many classrooms a climate of constant talking, checking of phones, subtle and not so subtle defiance. You do not need to be a professional teacher to realize how close to impossible it is to teach in such a climate. The result has been a general dumbing down of content and the use of non-challenging, not to say childish activities and strategies in an effort to keep pupils on side. COVID has had a severe impact on discipline, but attendance has declined sharply too. In a recent classroom observation, I saw 13 S4 pupils out of 25 on the class register. The teacher confirmed that was the norm. One pupil strolled in 20 minutes late and had forgotten where to sit. The teacher confirmed that she hadn't been in class for three weeks. This affects every pupil, not just the absentees. In the classroom, teaching has become like spinning plates. There is a group who have been attending regularly and are ready to move on, a group who missed the last lesson, some who have missed the last few lessons, and the odd pupil who has turned up after a few weeks off. What exactly is the teacher to teach to such a disparate group? Teacher stress levels are sky high, and it is no wonder that recruitment and retention of secondary teachers, particularly in STEM subjects, is such an issue. When we come to, when we come to consider how to remedy the situation in which we find ourselves, we need to consider more than just the curriculum and methodology. We need to consider how we introduce change and its impact, we need to value the professional expertise of teachers and schools and replace their lost autonomy. And urgently, urgently, we need to improve the classroom climate of indiscipline and poor attendance. And crucially, we need to ask ourselves, how did the inspectorate fail to identify the decline in standards and behaviour? We should not need PISA to tell us how our schools are performing. And I'll now hand over to Keir for the next session. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the title of the event is What is Wrong with Scottish Education? And the PISA results drew attention to this question, but there are undoubtedly many other things which are involved. Um, Carol has spoken about quite a lot of them, attendance or lack of it, poor behaviour and so forth. 
Undoubtedly, the causes of this complex of problems will be itself very complex and there will be a number of factors involved. But it cannot be coincidence that the decline which we have seen has coincided in time with the failed implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. And given my involvement with Curriculum for Excellence at the very beginning, I've been asked to uh, discuss this particular aspect. The first question that I think we have to answer when we're talking about Curriculum for Excellence is which Curriculum for Excellence are you talking about? Because there are two completely different ones uh, there is the document which was produced in 2004 and which uh, was said to be the basis on which subsequent development took place. And then there is the curriculum which is generally regarded as having been launched in 2010. And there are some very significant differences between these two, not all of which are invariably understood. The 2004 document in which I most certainly was closely involved was produced by a body called the Curriculum Review Group set up by the then government. Um, it did not have many detailed contents. What it put forward were four curriculum purposes, which came to be known for no particularly good reason as the four capacities. That was the first introduction of ugly and unnecessary jargon into Curriculum for Excellence implementation. Put forward seven curriculum principles. It suggested that um, greater latitude and discretion in curricular matters should be delegated to individual schools and indeed come to that, to individual departments and teachers within schools. It placed an increased emphasis on interdisciplinary learning and an emphasis upon skills. And that last one particularly has brought about really in the thinking of a lot of people, what I regard as being uh, a false dichotomy. It's often said that if you look around the world at the present moment, there are two kinds of curriculum in evidence. There is the kind of curriculum uh, with which CFE is most commonly identified, which is, you could say, a what children should become kind of curriculum. And then there are other curricula, as for example, South of the Border, which are to be characterised as what children should learn and know curricula. In practice, there is much less of a distinction between these two, at least at the level of principle, than might first be apparent. I mean, my contention would be, for example, that skills, and we would be put in the category of skills-based curriculum, skills are essentially the application of knowledge. No knowledge, no skill. Um, and that really largely dissolves the difference between the two. However, if a curriculum is approached in the way in which Curriculum for Excellence implementation subsequently was, without taking regard to the importance of the links between knowledge and skills, then you end up with very different and much more deleterious results. However, taking the 2004 document as a whole, and it was only eight pages long, it was most certainly not a curriculum. If I had to attach a label to it, I would say that it was a kind of mission statement. And indeed, that is what we as a curriculum review group were asked to produce. We were not asked to produce a curriculum. We were asked to outline the principles which should underpin the development of a curriculum. So obviously the development of the curriculum itself was the next stage. The development work proceeded extremely slowly after 2004, at least for the first few years. And there were two interesting features about the way in which it was undertaken. The first one was that practically nobody from the group that drew up the mission statement was asked to take any further part in the development. And a completely different group of people was set up with implementation in mind. And the second group, the implementation group, was much more dominated by the traditional kind of figures of the Scottish Educational Development, Scottish Educational Establishment, than uh, 
the curriculum review group had been. And all I, of that, I think, boded ill for what was subsequently to evolve. One could go on for a very long time about curriculum for excellence implementation uh, failures. I'm just going to touch very briefly on eight of them, and you'll no doubt be able to come up with your own list with at least as many in it as my list. First one, uh, very quickly, we became embroiled in a new set of qualifications changes and a new set of senior school examinations. This was not needed. Um, we could have done perfectly well under the existing standard grade qualifications, at least for a considerable period of time. And furthermore, it is not clear to me that the new qualifications represented a step forward compared with the old. Secondly, a very ambitious, time-consuming and human resource-consuming attempt, indeed, was made to try and define the curriculum in a different way. This resulted in uh, the so-called experiences and outcomes. And I think most people who have tried to work with them have found it extraordinarily difficult. As a way of specifying a curriculum, they were a failure. That is, of course, quite separate from the degree of irritation, which I'm sure you, like me, felt about the puerile way in which they were expressed by being put in the mouths of the child. Next, and by far the most important, was a downgrading of knowledge. Far from establishing the link between skills and knowledge that I mentioned earlier on, CFE, as actually developed and implemented, did not pay very much attention to knowledge, and teachers were um, encouraged to regard that as secondary to other curricular considerations. My next one concerns the Building the Curriculum series of documents, which was supposed to be the strategic overview that guided teachers in implementation. But strategic it was not. I don't know if anybody ever tried to draw up a list at the outset of what kind of topics should be covered in the Building the Curriculum series. But it is, for example, astonishing that Building the Curriculum 1 was devoted to the contribution of subjects, which is something that most teachers could discuss in their sleep. And there was no building the curriculum paper which dealt with interdisciplinary learning, which was a supposedly new feature of curriculum for excellence about which teachers did indeed need advice. And then, of course, we had, following the building the curriculum series, uh, an extraordinary proliferation of low level guidance. I, I had a slide I used to use um, when talking about this subject, which made the point that Curriculum for Excellence guidance contained four capacities, 12 attributes, 24 capabilities, five levels, seven principles, six entitlements, 10 aims, eight curriculum areas, four contexts for learning, 1,820 experiences and outcomes, and 20,000 pages. Um, when I put this up uh, in front of teachers, I expected people to fall about with laughter, and they didn't. The fact that they didn't demonstrates how inured to this kind of nonsense they had actually become by that time. There was next an inadequate level of professional development, and particularly, I think, at leadership level, because this was a complex uh, undertaking to implement at school level, and the guidance there was not forthcoming. And then at a more specific level, we have the fact that building the curriculum three um, led to a, a new concept of two three-year phases rather than three two-year phases in um, secondary education. And a simple error of arithmetic meant that there was no longer the space in the S4 curriculum to offer the to eight subjects at standard grade, which had been traditional. In fact, of course, um, <clears throat> even in terms of the kind of loosely specified curriculum of the era of the uh, uh, experiences and outcomes, you can see that if you have half the time, then half of eight is roughly speaking four. Um, and a, with a struggle, schools managed five or six. The result of that, of course, is that the schools offering the broadest curriculum to young people are the ones who ignored 
the official advice. And lastly, and uh, I think Carol touched on this as well, we have, over the same period of time, suffered a loss of data and reliable information with the result that it has been impossible to monitor the developments other than externally through PISA at an interval, generally speaking, of three years. So I, I will stop there. You will see that there is a plethora of problems relating to CFE implementation. And I'm delighted to uh, hand over to Bruce Robertson, head teacher of Berkshire High School, a new speaker as far as we are concerned, but a distinguished head teacher and a distinguished author on the subject of education as well. So you're very welcome, Bruce. We're delighted to have you. I'll hand over to you. That's very kind of you, Kier. Thank you very much. I echo everything that Kier has said, Carol has said, and Lindsay has said as well. Recently, I was asked to be a, a panellist at a debate about the Scottish curriculum at Dynamic Earth. Um, the panel was made up of MSPs from different parties. I asked the question, um, if the panel had to score the curriculum, the Scottish curriculum, out of 10, what score would they give it? The Conservative and the Labour representative said six, the Liberal Democrat representative said seven, and the Scottish National Party representative said eight. She then turned to me and asked what score I would give the Scottish curriculum, and I said three. And I stand by that. So perhaps what I could do over the next few minutes is to, to unpack some of that, uh, some of the issues, and, and perhaps signpost a way forward. For me, as I think uh, Kier has really suggested, it's the broad general education phase of the curriculum that is the biggest problem. I don't think there was too much wrong with the senior phase previously, and I don't think relatively there is too much wrong with it now. It's the broad general education phase, I think, that is the biggest problem. Um, the biggest problem with it is that it's just not at all clear. The experiences and outcomes that, that Kier talks about are just so vague and ambiguous. They're not even particularly well written. Um, I've got a few examples for literacy in English. I can show my understanding of what I listen to or watch by commenting with evidence on the content and form of short and extended texts. In maths, having determined which calculations are needed, I can solve problems involving whole numbers using a range of methods, sharing my approaches and solutions with others. And one more from technologies, I can extend and enhance my knowledge of digital technologies to collect, analyze ideas, relevant information, and organize these in an appropriate way. Now, as a teacher, as a parent, you are expected to make sense of these statements, as Keir said, over 200 in total. Uh, and work out from that what you're supposed to be teaching, what your child is supposed to be learning. But what is the specific knowledge? What are the specific skills? I agree with Kira completely. It's a false dichotomy to try to say that one is more important than the other. I've talked in my books about the sort of curriculum that we need in Scotland, one which is knowledge-based and skills-orientated, teaching students about specific things so that they can do specific things. But as I've argued in my books, for me, certainly, the broad general education phase, as set out in the experiences and outcomes, that's not a curriculum. It's just, it's just not clear enough to be called a curriculum. Because we're not clear about what we should be teaching, we're not clear about what we should be assessing. And then when it comes to trying to help parents understand how their child is progressing, well, that just becomes incredibly difficult. The justification for the vagueness, it's often um, because teachers should be empowered to decide what it is that they're teaching. Teachers in school should be empowered to do that. And I guess the expectation from the outset perhaps was give a broad steer nationally so that schools and teachers could unpack these experiences and outcomes into more specific knowledge and skills. That be the case, um, they were never really given the time to do that. They certainly weren't given any exemplification about what a high quality cur curriculum would look like by unpacking these experiences and outcomes. So the reality is that, that most teachers and schools have not done that. All the curriculum is, is the experiences and outcomes. And that just means that everybody, everybody is thoroughly confused about what they should be teaching. The quality of curriculum therefore differs wildly from school to school, from local authority to local authority. Um, and, th and that leaves that, that leads to inequity. Um, if you are lucky enough to go to a school with a high quality curriculum, which actually does specify the knowledge and skills that you should be learning, 
Well, that you're at a tremendous advantage than somebody who goes to a school that has not done that. Kira was talking about skills and knowledge as being a false dichotomy, but sometimes when people talk about skills, they're talking at far too high a level. They, they, they hear skill and they think transferable skill, like problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. These terms are not particularly useful. It's not that we don't want to teach students how to solve problems, to think critically and to be creative. We absolutely do. But they need the knowledge to be able to solve problems with, to be able to think critically about and to be creative with. The problem is a lack of knowledge. And most transferable skills, inverted commas, are not nearly as transferable as, as a lot of people would have you believe, because they are so dependent on the specific knowledge that underpins them. Um, when I was talking about progress, um, what schools have, have started to be asked to do is to report on what's called ACEL data, so achievement of a curriculum for excellence level. And you probably know there are five different levels in the broad general education, the early level, the first, second, third, and the fourth. Um, students are supposed to study these over about three years, and then using the experiences and outcomes, teachers have to report if a student has achieved a level. And I mean, absolutely no disrespect to teachers with this comment. Most teachers are just picking a number out of the air. They're just saying, well, yeah, you've achieved the second level, often just because they've studied at a particular level for a particular period of time. But this is a big problem because schools are reporting this data and then it's being picked up nationally. And then the press are using that to rank schools. So they will say in this particular school, 90% of primary seven pupils have achieved the second level. And then they'll compare it to another school where the reporting is maybe that only 70% of primary seven pupils have achieved the second level. But these numbers mean virtually nothing because there isn't a clear curriculum for teachers to be using to assess in a clear way. So just in terms of pointing the way forward, what do we need to do? Well, I think we, start, we need to start thinking about our curriculum as one which is knowledge-based and skills-orientated. I think somebody needs to take a lead in establishing a high-quality knowledge-based curriculum. We could sum up all of the issues, I think, as a failure of leadership. The curriculum that we develop nationally is unlikely to be perfect. It won't be. But an imperfect curriculum as a starting point is far better than having no curriculum at all. We do need to specify knowledge and skills at a national level, which is not to say that we're trying to put limits on learning. There should be space for schools, for teachers, for students to make some of the decision making themselves. But we need to stop being um, afraid to actually prescribe at a national level the specific things that we believe are important for young people to learn at school. As I say, it won't be perfect in the first instance, and it absolutely should evolve over time. But we need that. Um, if we want to compare the progress of young people between schools, then we need common assessment instruments. And these need to be developed nationally. And the inspectorate as was touched on before, they need to start taking an interest in the curriculum of schools. In my experience, they take very, very little interest in what is being taught in schools, apart from maybe the number of hours that are being given to a particular subject area like PE. But in terms of what specifically is being taught in history, in sciences, in all of the areas, the inspectorate aren't taking an interest. And I think that is a key part of the problem as well. Here, I think we need you to unmute, sorry. Ah, apologies. That's very unusual. I'm not usually skillful enough to mute it, so I don't encounter this difficulty, generally speaking. Um, the plan was that the four of us as speakers might have a short discussion, but I think with 60 people here waiting to get in their questions, that uh, that's probably not the most sensible thing to do. So I'll just throw it open. Uh, and then hand it back to Ali, because she's our chair for the day. Who would like to go first? Thank you, Kira. I think if I can coordinate the question. So I think um, Sarah has also put her hand. So uh, Sarah, if you want to ask your question. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm a local councillor in the Highlands. I'm, I'm delighted to hear Bruce's comments about ASAL data, um, because it's not really reliable for its purpose, in my opinion. I wanted to know what you thought about 
um, you know, it's all about teachers. And I would say, suggest that the teachers, the teachers, the, the people going to teaching in Scotland and England are going to be hugely different in terms of a profile. And it's quite hard to extrapolate in England. There's so much reform happened, what, what works, but there was a lot of effort to get people into teaching in different ways, like Teach First. Quite a lot of innovation happened down south, which Scotland resisted. But the I just feel, because I have family members who were teachers, and I recently went to look at a, a, an amazing inner city school in, in London, that the creative autonomy that within within the structure of a, a prescribed curriculum, the more the creative autonomy of some of the reforms in England that have allowed teachers and head teachers, you know, philosophically and in terms of pedagogy to to kind of make their school what they want their school to be for the kids that go to their school. And I, I'd be quite interested to hear what Bruce says, has to say about that. Why why are we so scared of letting people do the job that we've invested incredibly a lot of money into them doing and one comment for the head teacher that when I was in London and I said you know about I mean I'm a counsellor but for me bureaucracies just need to get out of the way enable rather than try and this absolute control because everything we do is is we're trying to control it from the top from top down and the ease and nose is just read something like something out of the soviet bloc to me always did i worked in a school for 12 years <laughs> and you know you just think let these just liberate our teachers and head teachers within accountability within all those issues and the other key thing that this school could do was recruit they had the freedom to recruit and staff their school in a way that worked for their school with their intake that might have meant more his, you know, it might have meant more support in pastoral care. It might, you know, just having that freedom rather than and freedom to pay them what they felt they needed to pay them to get the best people. So all your thoughts about that would be tremendously helpful. Thank you. Bruce. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, a lot to unpack in that. I'll go in reverse. In terms of the autonomy that schools have. They, they don't have nearly as much as most people might believe they have. The autonomy and the power really sits with the local authority. And depending on the local authority your school is in, um, well, well, that can really hamper your progress. Uh, decisions about staffing in some local authorities uh, are made centrally, and, and the local authority has um, quite a grip on that. In terms of initial teacher education, I don't want to upset people here, but I'm not convinced that, that taken as a national whole, it's particularly great. I think there's some really good work going on at the moment in Napier University in Edinburgh. Uh, much more of a focus on the science of how people learn messages from cognitive science, uh, on educational research. I think in too many teacher, initial teacher training at institutes, it's got far more to do with ideology and, and far less to do with actual research and the science of how we learn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I give presentations to teachers, I say that until relatively recently in my career, I've been working in education for about 20 years. I had never been encouraged at all to think about how learning happens. And when you take a step back, you know, training as a teacher, you would <coughs> probably be the first thing that you learned. But it's only by <laughs> engaging my own professional learning and development that I really have started to understand how learning actually happens. I think that because initial teacher education on the whole is quite poor, actually what, what is helping teachers is, is the quality of professional development that they might be getting in a school. So I think we should be much more creative in, in the routes that we have for teachers to get into schools because we do have a problem with the workforce, we just don't have enough teachers. So we need to get more teachers in and we need to help schools to help train those teachers. And, and that, that can be done. Could I come in on this um, just a little bit? I don't think it matters to the same extent um, how you get the staff in. And I think as long as they're qualified staff, so I think Sarah's point about you know, the recruitment and so on, I don't think that's particularly relevant. I think what really matters is that I agree with Bruce about the initial teacher training. 
about teachers being autonomous, we've had far too much attention paid to, as I said, dictating virtually to teachers how they would teach. What we have not had enough of is a proper curriculum and then standards, which then bring in that accountability. We have, to be perfectly frank, the first real accountability in Scotland doesn't come in till you get to fourth year and the national fives. There isn't anything happening before that, and that's far too late. I noticed in one of the questions in the chat, somebody asked about why doesn't Scotland use reading ages to assess how children are progressing in, in terms of literacy. Now, I'm very, very interested in literacy. I think it's a key skill which has not had enough attention generally. Um, and I definitely would like to see a proper system of standards that start in the primary school and work their way up. We should not be having people who are poor readers emerging after seven years of education and then finding that secondary schools are possibly not in a position to assist them. I agree with, I agreed with um, Bruce about the BGE being a problem and I never understood why that was extended because the inspector had been saying for years that S1 and S2 children were marking time. I didn't actually agree with that, but that's what the inspector said. And then they said, so now we'll extend it through S1, S2 and S3. So that made no logic to me. It is about standards. And I think that's what has happened south of the border. It's the introduction of not only standards, but a very formal system of assessment to see how children are progressing against those standards. And we have been missing that for years now. Thanks, Carol. I think that might lead into our next questioner, um, Gillian, who's got her hands up. I think she has a question about literacy, actually. Yeah, my background, I've said, mentioned previously in a meeting like this, I had to take my five-year-old, um, 10-year-old child out of school to protect his mental health because nobody had taught him how to read. And I didn't realise he had dyslexia. And the education of teachers is atrocious in Scotland because there's no focus on the science of reading. So no teacher that crossed this child's path knew how to teach him to read. Worse, the authority bought in a curriculum called Active Literacy promoted by the Scottish government, which is banned in England because it's inadequate. So there's thousands of children being exposed to a poor curriculum, which children with good brain networks is fine because their brains are compensating for a weak um, literacy programme. I'm a scientist. I researched how to teach a child how to read, and my child is now reading. But as a scientist, I have gone and doing a root cause analysis as to why the system failed my son. And oh my gosh, there is no science acumen within the Scottish education system at any level. And teachers are taught about reflective practice. I'm taught about root cause analysis. So I've looked at... Uh, when the Scottish Government decided that they would do standardised testing across Scotland, there is deliberate decisions making within the Scottish um, Government and within the, the Education Scotland that they decided they would measure children's ability according to the levels of the Curriculum for Excellence. Now in Primary 1 and Primary 2 there is no measure in the outcomes and evaluation that a child should know the 26 letters of the alphabet, or a child should know the 44 phonemes of our language. So my son was, was meeting and being ticked that he's, a, he's doing the levels of the um, curriculum for excellence and he couldn't read. But the teachers are assessing him because they're they are saying, yeah, yeah, he's met level one, Hadn't, can't read. Then I look back at the government, they, do, they brought in the Scottish National Standardised Assessment and people deliberately chose to measure it against the curriculum for excellence. And at that time, the University of Durham had the best scientific data on children and how they learn to read. And it's based on the science of reading. And the Scottish government, they put in a bid for it and they says, oh yeah, your, your data doesn't match the curriculum for excellence. And it's based on the English system. So the University of Durham had the reading ages, decoding ages, vocabulary ages of 50% of the children of Scotland and the Scottish government refused it to do it. They went for something completely different. So it's Scottish and deliberately so that the Scottish attainment of children in Scotland could not be measured against the children of England. 
I am now reviewing data that comes from the, the University of Durham data, and I put up in my post, the North Lanarkshire, they had in their education committee minutes that they had measured using standardized assessments and they knew they sent 800 pupils into secondary school with reading ages of below nine and a half years, which is functionally illiterate. So they, uh, those children had spent seven years in schools not being taught how to read and reading is a taught skill. And so the system has failed these children and North Lanarkshire says only 0.9% of their children have dyslexia. So that means 792 children were failed to be taught how to read. So for me, the question to the panel is, why is there no focus on primary one and primary two? These are the fundamental skills that humans have to learn, reading, writing, and maths. And no one is focusing on teaching these teachers how to do it, checking standards about the curriculums that they use, the, the programs that they use, and make sure every child leaving primary two can learn how to read, write, and count. And the worst thing is, the insidious play-based learning has come in and children are being delayed, being taught these fundamental skills. And for children born with dyslexia, they have to be taught these skills at the ages of five, six and seven. If they wait till after seven, it's harder and harder. So the brain uh, science is not getting into teachers and they are being persuaded to do play-based learning. And I saw that as another question popping up. So why? Why is there not a big outcry by MSPs that, that the reading ages has not been measured? And this is a deliberate tactic by the government and Education Scotland to make sure children in Scotland are not compared to the children of England. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I could just answer a bit uh, briefly on that. Um, I share all your concerns and I actually began to think like this uh, way back about the year 2000 that and it wasn't based on having sort of personal experience of somebody, you know, in my family or whatever it could be. It was based on what I was seeing coming in the door in first year in secondary school, that children simply could not do the things that I would have expected them to be able to do, not in literacy and actually not in, in arithmetic either. So it was it was simple observation of what was happening. And I found it virtually impossible. I did in my own authority raise this and I found it virtually impossible to make any headway at all. My own background is in mathematics. I'm not a literacy specialist, but it was obvious to me that there was something going sadly wrong. And I would, I do think it, is, it, it will have a knock-on effect through the curriculum. And it is one of the things that Scotland needs to tackle if it is going to improve the PISA results. Um, if I could ask Alex Massey, I think he's got a couple of questions. Uh, thanks, Alison. Yes, uh, thank you all for taking part in this. It's been uh, very uh, interesting and illuminating, if also uh, <laughs> rather <laughs> gloomy. Um, uh, I was going to ask about, um, obviously, in the media, we tend to... to focus more on secondary school than we do on, on primary school, but um, primaries are obviously where things begin. I was going to ask a bit about what value you might all attach to the, the ethos of play-based learning. Um, but secondly, and perhaps uh, at a higher level, when you come to, uh, what, what, what view does the panel have of the political leadership of Scottish education? And by that, I don't just mean uh, the current government. Um, how much confidence do you have that any political party uh, grasps either the depth or the seriousness of the problem? Uh, and how much confidence do you have that any of them have any significant ideas that deviate from what one might term the McBlob uh, educational establishment's view of how Scottish education should be? Because from a media point of view, it seems to me that we have mediocrity and we relabel it triumph. Uh, and so is one of the problems, perhaps, uh, that there has been a surfeit of consensus at a political level in Scotland for perhaps 20 years? Perhaps I could start this. Um, thanks, Ali. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think that I don't think actually that I would primarily blame politicians because with a tiny number of exceptions, they're not education specialists. One of the exceptions, of course, is the present cabinet secretary for education, but we'll leave aside particular individuals. 
I think the issue is precisely what you said there. It's the educational establishment. And of course, some people might say I'm part of that, and I am a university professor. So I, too, have my limits and so on. But nevertheless, it seems to me that the overwhelming weight of consensus is exactly as Bruce Robertson outlined earlier on in relation to initial teacher education and also teacher professional development, which is a certain kind of ideology that deplores lots of things and celebrates other things. And the things that deplores demonstrably work and the things that it celebrates demonstrably don't work. So let's take the example of play-based learning. Now, there is very good psychological research, research relating to child development. Up to a certain age, round about age six or seven, play can be an extremely powerful learning tool. And we all know that from very young children. Obviously, children age, let us say, two, learn about the world by exploring it. That's usually what is meant by play-based learning. But there's two caveats I would add to this. One is that in school, once children get to school and are no longer crawling around in the nursery, the play has to be directed play, directed by an expert teacher that knows where it is going. It's simply anarchic, spontaneous play gets absolutely nowhere at all. So that's the first thing that is absent from the current mania for play-based learning. The second thing that is absent, however, is the major thing really, which is all the same research that shows that that kind of directed play works up to about age six or seven, shows that it doesn't work after that. That's crucial. And it, from roughly, in other words, in Scottish terms, about P3 onwards, primary three, primary four onwards, right through to the end of schooling, it has to be structured in terms of knowledge, of disciplines, of subjects, the kinds of things that Carol and Bruce have been talking about and that other contributors here have been talking about as well. And of course, that is partly also the structure of learning properly to read and learning properly to do mathematics, but beyond that, learning the disciplines of science, of languages, history, and, and so on and so forth. Now, that's just one example of the way in which the educational establishment in Scotland, which is, of course, just part of a global educational establishment that believes in all these things, has, in a sense, I think, pulled the wool over the eyes of the politicians. They've looked at the admirable aims of the original Curriculum for Excellence document, which Keir summarised earlier on, and who could dissent from that? And then they take it that because these original aims are still there, plastered over every single classroom in Scotland and called the four capacities, that somehow that actually requires them, the politicians, to sign up to the other 30,000 pages of useless the recommendations and documents that has been spawned by the deep, the specification of that, the specification by the educational establishment. I, I, I don't know how a politician gets around this because how does a politician who's got to deal with every aspect of social policy in Scotland get inside that establishment? And so most of them can't, and for understandable reasons to do with pressure and time and, and their own professional backgrounds and so on and so forth. So basically, Scottish education, despite devolution, is not run, actually, by the democracy of the Scottish Parliament. It's run by all these committees and quangos and managers and directors and measurers and so on, who staff the quangos, who staff the local authorities, and actually subscribe to that international consensus, which, as I said, I don't think is educationally effective at all. May I add just a couple of points to that? I completely agree with what, what Lindsay has said. There has been no uh, politician who's had a significant impact on Scottish education for a very, very long time. Um, mm. uh, because one party has been in power now in Scotland for 16 years, it's almost impossible to talk about the shortcomings of Scottish education without by implication seeming to uh, criticise the SNP. But that's not the point of what I'm trying to say at all. Um, let me give you two examples from the SNP's period in power. Shortly after Nicola Sturgeon made her declaration about judge her on education, she did take up the question of the lack of solid information that we have about performance, particularly in the primary school. And it looked as though she was about to introduce something like proper standardised testing into primary schools, but she didn't. A good few years later on, John Swinney, as the Education Minister, actually got as far as introducing a bill into the Scottish Parliament, which was going to uh, increase the autonomy of Scottish schools and obviously thereby reduce the stranglehold over Scottish education held by others. And that was withdrawn. In both of these uh, cases, the politicians were beaten back by the establishment of the Scottish education system, demonstrating conclusively who it is who really runs education in Scotland. And I think that what Lindsay has just said is important because unless we start to focus on the shortcomings of that leadership group 
and start to tackle the degree of autonomy which they have exercised for a very long period in an entirely irresponsible and unsuccessful manner, we are not likely to make much progress. If I could come I, on. I, I would that. echo that. And I'd also add if, if, that the reason the politicians are in a difficulty is they are being advised by people, the inspectorate and the Education Scotland and various other groups, and these people are, have all got this group think that um, they know best and, and that's it regardless of data. And if we take something that was just mentioned there about the play-based learning, that is a serious misinterpretation of what kindergarten provide because there is this a constant thing about you know Scotland could be like Denmark or Sweden and they operate a kindergarten system. A kindergarten in the Scandinavian country does not mean playing, nothing like it. It's all about seriously directed activity. And I think that is a result of somebody has suggested and given an idea, they've turned it over to the educational experts who've completely um, misinterpreted what's what is required and we're having we are ending up with in some authorities the first three years of schooling simply being largely shambolic and it, it is it is down to this educational establishment having far too strong a grip on what happens in Scottish schools and not the real experts who are the teachers and the schools. And Ali, if I could quickly come in, the, the thing that seem, that uh, those in the establishment seem to be wanting to control is more pedagogy than it is the curriculum. So play-based learning, that's about how you learn. When we look at the experiences and outcomes, the one thing that is actually prescribed is the way that teachers should be teaching. So many of these will start with phrases like by researching, by investigating. So it's this focus on student-led learning. But the research on cognitive science and how people learn is pretty clear that for anyone except for experts, approaches which are teacher-led will be the most effective and the most efficient in the early to mid stages of, of learning anything new. That's regardless of age and stage. So that applies as much to um, a primary school pupil learning to read and to write as it does to a sixth year student studying advanced higher chemistry teacher-led approaches in the early to mid stages of learning anything new will almost always be more effective than student-led approaches. Once students become more expert in a particular area, then their learning can benefit by them taking more control over it. But it's this focus on student-led learning, which is, is another part of the problem. And if you pick up any inspection report, you'll see some sort of reference in, in most of them. They, they will say things like, the lessons were, were overly teacher-led. Students need to be allowed to lead their learning more. But this is really, really unhelpful advice. Thanks, Bruce. Right, I'm realizing we've got lots of questions and running out of time. So what I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask a couple of people but very, very, very short, specific questions. So I'm going to ask Jules and then Charlie Rayburn and then I think Derek Young. But as I say, very, very short questions, please. So okay. Jules, can we have yours first? Thank you. Yeah, um, I've been reading um, some of the uh, recommendations off the Haywood Review where it said that nothing was off the table. So would the panel comment on the recommendations of the proposed Scottish Diploma of Achievement, which includes learner pathways in terms of raising academic standards? Thanks, Jules. And I say we're going to take all the questions and then we'll go back to the panel. So, um, Charlie, can I get your quick question, please? I, yeah, I, it's not easy to ask this one in a quick way, but I'll try. Can we spend a little bit more time in the state system talking about informal learning? A lot of things in my time have been thrown out because we were told we could not assess or certificate that learning. And so in particular in the secondary schools, a lot of subjects were completely changed to doing things that you could examine. There's a lot of other associated questions, but that's my main one. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. And Derek, very quickly. Uh, thanks, Ali. Well, perhaps unhelpfully, I'd actually posted two different things in the chat, so I'm not entirely sure which one Ali thought was the most valuable one to ask. But uh, these were connected, and what I basically said was, is it evident that there's a, a scepticism, and I think part of this part has been answered, about rigour in the curriculum and the focus on a knowledge-based curriculum, which Bruce had previously referred to. 
And if so, what do you think is causing it rather than pinning it on an establishment? And we've not named any names here apart from identifying a few organisations, but really the focus on the next steps, if the PISA results aren't enough to try and sort of shift and undermine that thinking, what is it that would achieve that? Well, I start on Hayward. Right. So the review led by Professor Louise Hayward of Glasgow University um, reported in June or May, early summer last year, this year, and it is officially still the way forward, according to the Scottish Government for assessment. And it seems to command a, a consensus across the Scottish Parliament. Um, now, there's a lot of interesting discussion in the Hayward Review, but it seems to me to miss, I think, three fundamental points and it therefore gets it wrong. The first one is a historical aspect. And although this may sound a typical kind of academic, geeky, scholarly thing, but it completely fails to understand the history of assessment in Scotland. It is woefully inadequate for a report that claims to be addressing the history of Scottish assessment. It's based on a research report in that respect, for example, whose own most recent in reference is dated 1963. It's 60 years out of date in its understanding of current Scottish assessment practice. It, we can go into lots of details why that's the case. But first of all, that means that the report is not likely to be very good at assessing the current situation. The second point is that the report, although ostensibly at the top, as it were, says that both exams and also continuous assessment you know, projects and, pro and essays and things are both exams and projects, let's call them projects, are important in assessment. It is weighted throughout and strongly biased against exams. By exams, I mean a sit down, invigilated exam of the kind that people of my age regard as what assessment is. It is, it is almost implying at certain points, and the chair of the thing has actually said that she would quite like all invigilated exams to come to an end in Scottish education. Now, what that neglects, of course, is the inherent biases in all non-invigilated assessment. I don't mean bias in the sense that parents deliberately cheat. Of course not. It's simply that if you are a good parent and you discuss your, your, your children's work at home and you yourself have some relevant experience or knowledge or expertise in relation to that work, then you cannot help but help your child to do well in the non-exam assessments simply by talking about it. Uh, so whereas of course you cannot do that in the invigilated exam room where everybody is literally on their own, everybody's on a level playing field. So exams, invigilated exams, are actually the most egalitarian form of assessment that human beings have ever invented. And of course, you can demonstrate that historically. The reason why women and people from minority ethnic groups and Catholics in Scotland have a much stronger status as citizens of Scottish society than they did 100 years ago is precisely because they could demonstrate objectively through exams that their worth was every bit as strong as that of white Protestant men. And over and over again in Scotland and throughout the world, exams, in other words, have been emancipatory. They have been liberating. And if we return to a system in which it's all done by essays and projects and so on, we will return to all these biases that used to discriminate against women and Catholics and minority ethnic groups and so on and so forth. And the third thing I would say is this, that yes, of course, there is a place for non-exam, non-invigilated assessment, but the two things do different kinds of things. For example, if you want to assess people's capacity to do research, to work in teams and to engage in discussion, then exams are not very good. That is where, of course, other forms of assessment do have an important place. But exams have a unique place too. For example, the capacity to think on your feet, the capacity to, to recall the major the structure of an argument and get it down on paper very, very quickly. The, the capacity to respond quickly to unusual stimuli. All of these things are extremely difficult. I would say actually impossible to replicate in non-invigilated circumstances. And that's why exams are really important. Now, all these arguments I've just put forward, you may disagree with them, of course, absolutely. But none of these arguments I've just put forward are actually even addressed in the Hayward report. It is a remarkably ignorant, and I would say probably willfully ignorant report, which is really... I would have to say quite disgraceful, but yet there it is now as the guide to future Scottish assessment. I think that is an even bigger disaster than curriculum for excellence waiting to happen. Carol, do you want to have any? Well, I would echo what, a lot of what, what Lindsay has said about, about the Hayward Review, but I'll not, I'll not go into any detail in that. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll try and answer Derek's question about um, the scepticism regarding rigour, and I would say that's almost endemic at the moment in Scottish education. Um, partly it's to do with the methodologies that are used. When If, 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 if it's student-led learning, then it's not going to be particularly rigorous. I, I sit through very painful lessons sometimes watching teachers trying to draw out of the class 
something that is brand new to the class. And if it were already in them, you know, why would you be bothering to teach them that it isn't? And so you hear lots of wrong suggestions and ideas and garbled views and so on. And I think many children, particularly at lower ability children, are totally confused by answers that their fellow pupils are giving, which are incorrect, or they may be correct, but the reasoning is all wrong and so on. So the, rig the rigor only will come into our curriculum when the teacher is leading it, because it's only the teacher that really understands the rigor. And some of the time also um, assessment drives rigor as well. And we don't use throughout the school year, not just in terms of final examinations, um, and examinations for qualifications, we don't use rigorous assessment at any point so that pupils don't develop that natural understanding that sometimes you have to really look at the detail and you can't make vague statements and you have to understand, you know, I, I say as a mathematician, you know, it's easier to solve a triangle if it's a right angle triangle, so I'll just assume it is. Now, that's not, that's not an uncommon um, reaction. Now, Children are not rigorously looking to see what information they've got. So, yes, I do think a lack of rigour in the curriculum, and it applies in English as well. I mean, who cares where you put an apostrophe? Just throw one on every time you see an S. Now, we've all seen experience, we've all had experience of that kind of thing. And, yes, in, if we're going to have a better curriculum, it needs to involve an element of rigour. Bruce, have you got some comments? Yeah, I echo everything that Lindsay said and Carol as well. Um, I think the push for student-led learning from some in the establishment has become has come about because they've observed some poor teaching, inverted commas, and the solution to that in their mind is to minimise the role of the teacher and to maximise the role of the student. Now, teacher-led learning can be poor, but it's about helping teachers to, to understand how to make it as good as it can be. Sometimes people misunderstand teacher-led approaches to mean lecturing, and that's not what we mean. Uh, the best teacher-led approaches will be very interactive, infused with questioning and discussion. The same principle then applies to examinations. Um, sometimes examinations, questions can be quite poor. Uh, the criticism of examination is often that it's assessing rote learning. Well, the solution to that is not to ditch exams altogether, it's to come up with better questions so that students can do all of the things that Lindsay described. So I think there's some, some commonality between the two points. What about you for your final comments? I'll be very quick. Lindsay made such a good job of demolishing the Hayward report <laughs> and defending the principles of examination that I find myself with just one thing to add, which is really very similar to where Bruce finished up there. Lindsay's defence was of the principles of invigilated assessment as a way of judging in a, in a, in a way that is egalitarian and fair. That's not the same thing as saying the examinations that we've got at the present moment are the best that they could be. Um, some of them are extremely trivial. Some of them let pupils rehearse and memorize and bring into examinations what they've already done. This is a pitiful form of examination. So in defending the principle, we are most certainly not saying that the exam system as it currently pertains in Scotland is all that it should be. Thanks, Keir. And I think uh, despite many more questions, we could go on for a lot longer, but we've already run over a bit. But I think that shows the um, the interest in the subject and clearly the, the need to, for there to be more discussion and more focus on actually finding a way forward. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming along today, particularly to Carol, Bruce, Lindsay and Keir for a fantastic and really insightful discussion. We'll certainly be doing more on this in the new year. Um, thanks to everybody else for their contributions. This is Reform Scotland's last event of 2023, so I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas, and we'll be back in 2024 for further discussions. Um, so in the meantime, thank you very much. <laughs>